So if you're in the military, you do what you're told. We're not responsible. And uh, so after Nuremberg, the United Nations by 1950 created the Nuremberg Convention. The Nuremberg Convention, signed by many nations around the world, including the United States, said that uh, uh, people who are obeying orders under military command or any command from their uh, higher officials are responsible for their actions. And if they create, if they engage in war crimes or crimes against humanity, uh, uh, they are responsible personally. And so that's the first time in human history, right, that this idea has come that there's a personal responsibility of people who are in military for their actions. Uh, what the International Criminal Court is, which was, uh, um, which the Assembly of States Parties, uh, now about 120 countries to, uh, working together, uh, not including the United States, which hasn't been part of that, uh, they, they decided that this Nure these Nuremberg principles had to be enforced in some way. Right? People had to be held responsible for their actions. And just to have a convention isn't enough. You've got to have enforcement, right? This is government in some sense. So they created the International Criminal Court, uh, uh, and uh, it's now functioning. It opened its doors in 2002, and it's now functioning. But it was created by an assembly of states who are sovereign nations and who aren't about to give up that sovereignty, right? And we saw that one aspect of sovereignty is legitimate, internal authority, law, rule of law internally. The other aspect of a sovereignty is not legitimate, right? It is lawlessness. It says that there's no, I recognize no force over myself. The ICC, is predicated on the principle of complementarity. That's what they call it. Eugenia and I were at the 10th review conference of the ICC in the year 2012 in Uganda, Africa. And it was there very, very, it was very well uh, um, attended by all these nations and so on. And, uh, and the principle of complementarity says that the court cannot subpoena any witness or, or it cannot uh, cre uh, establish a warrant for arrest of any person anywhere in the world, cannot do this without the agreement, the complementary agreement of the nation that person is in, who, is a, who would be one of the nations in the Assembly of States Parties, because the nations are not going to give a court authority over themselves. Right? So the ICC is simply, has, and what we did in the Provisional World Parliament is take that the excellent Rome statue of the uh, criminal court, Eugenia did most of that work, and we uh, reissued that as a genuine law for, our, for the world court system which means that uh, the court, when it makes a, uh, when it issues a warrant, has authority to do this. It doesn't have to request uh, that someone come before the court as a subpoena. It has the authority to mandate. And uh, uh, so this is, you know, the, and it's the same with the International Court of Justice. You may know in The Hague, the International Court of Justice is there to uh, educate, adjudicate uh, disputes between nations. But coming before the court is voluntary on the part of nations. It has no authority to force nations to come before it. And it has no authority, once it makes its decisions, to enforce them. The U.S. In Nicaragua, we're in that court in the 1980s because you might remember the United States had the Contra terrorists housed in Honduras who were coming into Nicaragua and raping and murdering and killing uh, the citizens of Nicaragua. Uh, and the U.S. said, unless we're going to keep doing this to you until you get rid of the Sandinista socialists in your country. 
they went before the court, and the U.S. in its arrogance all said, okay, we'll go before the court voluntarily. The court ruled in favor of Nicaragua. It said the U.S. had violated international law, and it assigned $7 billion in damage. Or I don't remember the exact figure. I might be wrong about that, but quite a lot of money. How much of that do you think has been paid? <laughs> Zero. 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 That's not government, right? This is, this is the nation state, the sovereign nation state system that is incapable of controlling the big and powerful nations. They do what they want. Uh, so, yes? Just a quick question. So there is a collegium of world judges, but no court at this time. No court at this time. So there, uh, so I guess that makes this question not fit, but I was wondering if any of the individual ratifiers um, had ever appealed to the collegium, of course they're not a court, for a redress of any grievance uh, under yeah, any... Not, not yet. No, because they, there's no mechanism for that until there's a court? Right. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I was on the question. Uh, so, uh, you were speaking on, on um, the international, um, excuse me, uh, international criminal court. Is this what you were saying that um, that military personnel are held accountable for their actions? Uh, and, 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 or even though they're bound by the contracts and firing out orders, how does that well, yeah, it's a good question. But anyone, anyone in the military is in a bind, right? right? But, uh, since Nuremberg, at least, right? Because anyone in the military, uh, if you disobey orders, you're in deep doo doo, right? And they they have capacity to really punish people when they ordered. Deployment to Iraq in the Second Iraq War in 2003. There were a few officers that refused to go. They said this is an illegal war. This is an, an aggression, invasion, and it violates international law. And the U.S. W was brutal with them. It prosecuted them, right? And uh, uh, um, one or two of them got off. Actually, got off because they had good representation from lawyers who rally behind them and so on. But but it's it's a serious thing, right? And if we if we can get rid of war, which would be, you know, what we're trying to do on this planet, people wouldn't be in that bind. But, you know, what what this principle does since Nuremberg uh, and since the Nuremberg Convention in 1950 is say that, you know, under international law, People are responsible for their individual actions. In, in illegal or, it's an illegal order if you're, you know, ordered to torture someone. Or, exactly what law are you speaking of? Pardon? What law exactly are you speaking of? It's, you can go on the web and find it. It's uh, called the Nuremberg Convention of 1950. Uh, you remember you were saying they were breaking... Uh, that's the law they were breaking. Oh, so that's... The, the that's international law, law. yeah. Eugene. International law, which is not enforceable, and the ICC is the first step toward enforcing it. But as we saw, it's limited to by the nation-state system. Uh, here's uh, a new initiative that um, we we're looking for people who have uh, courage and who have vision and who have chutzpah. Uh, and uh, S.D. Vijayan is one of these people. Uh, uh, he, he uh, you know, he, I, uh, we came, came into contact with him through mutual, uh, um, uh, through other officers in uh, WCPA, and he understood our vision, and he's the head of an organization called Healing Earth, that has all kinds of resources for uh, uh, planting trees. They have a mandate to plant millions of trees in India in the next few years. He says in the next five years they're going to have all these trees planted. So, so healing earth, right it perfectly in line with the sustainability goals of the Earth Constitution, which say that the Earth 
not only needs to be protected, but it needs to be restored because it's degraded so seriously. So uh, he has uh, offered, and we have sent him a certificate recognizing him officially as the world is the uh, world government minister of the environment. And so Healing Earth, his organization, is now a governmental organization working. It's uh, the Ministry of the Environment, uh, which is recognized by the Constitution, uh, working uh, uh, to restore and plant the earth. So if we, you know, part of our, you can see part of our strategy for the future is to get people and organizations to realize that they, that they can take on governmental responsibility. Not, they're not just NGOs who have to say, oh, give me legal permission from my government to raise funds, and I promise not to do anything political, and so on. We don't have to do that, right? We're, we're creating the future of the planet, and these legal organizations called nation states don't have the legitimacy, the moral or, or right to, to prevent us from doing that. So, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is from a letter uh, that he wrote to me, that B.J. BJ, uh, BJ wrote to me. He says, I understand we both agree on conceptual points of WCPA and Healing Earth, both working toward the same goal. And I have done my homework to study all aspects of the first activity of tree plant plantation and to manage all the resources to complete it. This includes building a strong network of persons, of humans. I will read all the literature of WCPA and the Earth Federation a few more times, but for now I'd like to share the implementation part of Healing Earth and how I plan to go forward and associate it with WCPA. <laughs> so the, uh, the other thing, as uh, you all know, is we've held sessions of the Provisional World Parliament. And this has, this probably had, it's the thing we've done most with. We've held 14 sessions so far in a number of different countries. And it has, I think, the most potential uh, to attract interest of people because all over you pe say people, who, you know, go online, you, say pe you see people who are saying, we need a world parliament, holding up signs and so on. It's all over the place on this planet. And if we can uh, focus the attention of all these people who are calling for a world parliament to the fact that you can't have a world parliament without a constitution, right? You just can't just, like Gary Davis tried to do, you just can't create government with the World Service Authority without the whole framework which makes government effective and possible, and uh, gives a makes the decision making process on laws and how they're implemented and how they're enforced and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, so, yeah, this is this is has real potential. And uh, uh, we've had uh, some sessions of the parliament have been quite successful, and other sessions. Uh, disappointing and uh, it seems to me that the disappointing sessions are counterproductive because if we're if we're saying we're the emerging world government and you have you know uh, 70 people show up uh, and uh, from only 10 countries it doesn't really say much about uh, representing 7 billion people on this planet but we've had some pretty significant ones. These are two of them. Uh, the second session was in India in uh, uh, 1985, and it was opened by Zyle Singh, the then president of India. This is him. This Prime is no, he was president. No, what I'm saying is it was opened by President Michelle Singh, but Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi is also up on the dais, as well as two or three other members of the parliament. And I think that's a uh, Savitri Nigam, uh, a congresswoman uh, uh -huh. of, of the Indian Lok Sabha, the, the lower house. 
um, speaking. Um, Good. Yeah. yeah. So it was. It was, and it was held. The opening session was held at the famous Constitution Club of India, which is a huge, elegant place in New Delhi where the Constitution of India itself was signed. So everybody in India knows about this place and so on. It got great press. It was, it was widely known. And if we had kept holding parliaments like this, uh, the, the whole, things would be very different now. But it, it didn't work out that way. This, uh, I just want to say uh, yeah. congratulations to get the president and the prime minister of a major country like India up on the dais for your, yeah. you know, organization's parliament. That is just an amazing achievement you made. It is. And, and several members of the Indian uh, Senate and Congress, the Lok Sabha and And we're, so the next one, as I'll mention in a moment, is scheduled for India again, and we're hoping uh, we, we've got contacts with these high officials, with uh, Modi, Prime Minister Modi, and the president, current president of India, and we're hoping we can get the government of India. See, it's got, in these days, it saw itself as the leader of the non-aligned movement and, and had a vision of world peace, right? Now, you know, but like all many governments, it's been colonized by the uh, big corporations by the U.S. has tremendous influence there now in India, and it they don't have the government doesn't have such a clear vision of the need for peace. Right? The first prime minister Nehru was a world federalist, and he said we need world government. Right? But slowly it's it's been transformed because we have a world that is dominated by these forces, these undemocratic forces. Um, but uh, we're working. We're working on it for the next one. Uh, so the plan uh, 15 session. Right now it's scheduled for Kolkata, December 19 or January 20th. Any right now, any signatory of the Earth Constitution can be a delegate. Right? If you sign the Earth Constitution, which means that you pledge that this is the law of the world that you support. Uh, you can be a, a voting delegate. It's also, we also have provision for uh, observers. Any nation, anybody can come as an observer. They just can't vote unless you're a signatory to the Constitution. Uh, proposed legislation has to go uh, through the uh, Legislative Review Committee. Eugenia is the chair of that committee. Uh, so it has to be written in quality uh, uh, language according to drafting regulations which are they're widely known for people who do legislation, right? And uh, uh, so they, uh, it, and it will be posted six months in advance. So everybody who is signing up to be a delegate will have access to the legislation, proposed legislation that they can study and think about, and then when the uh, when parliament actually takes place, they'll be ready to debate it, to discuss it, to modify it if necessary, uh, to pass it or reject it as they see fit. Uh, we uh, the opening ceremonies uh, in some of our parliaments have had uh, uh, tremendous opening ceremonies, and at the one I. At the picture I showed you of the one in Libya and Tripoli, uh, the foreign minister of Libya was there at the opening ceremonies. Uh, uh, high government officials give it dignity, they give it legitimacy, and most of all, they give it newsworthiness. Right? The, the press shows up, and uh, very important because we want the world to know what we're doing, and so on. And in the case of uh, the next one, uh, the People's Parties International uh, uh, that we just signed the agreement with, they are promising to give us a mass march the day before the parliament of 50 to 100,000 people demanding world government. A mass march through the streets of Kolkata or whatever city it's in. It has to be in India for them to do that because all their there many people are in India, but uh, but that uh, so this again will be 
newsworthy, and we expect it to be, we're hoping to make it very significant. With, with the contacts you have and the growing contacts that you're achieving, you should make this a global march. Get people all over the world to march for world government. I mean, you've got time to plan it if, you're, if the next parliament isn't until the end of 2019. Well, but if you think about it, you get world yeah, good we're point. helping and I mean, do it in as many nations as possible on the same day. Yeah. We'll, we'll get the good point. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, be in touch with uh, People's Parties International and try to organize it uh, outside of India as well and get yeah. to invite people. Very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said any signatory of the Constitution may be a delegate, but does that mean they appoint themselves? They just go and, or do they have to be? Uh, is there some election process or something? No, no. Right, it, uh, when I first started going to the parliaments, my first parliament was uh, the fourth session in 1996. Uh, they required that you be a representative of some organization, NGO, and so I uh, got approval from uh, International Philosophers for Peace uh, to represent them. And, uh, but, but since that time, uh, we've, as I mentioned, we lost our, our tremendous sources of funding uh, in 2003, and we've, uh, so we've had to scale back on how we can uh, confirm and how we can uh, organize these things. So now they just have to be a signatory. Of course, we know if they're a signatory or not because we have, they sign it and, and it used to be they would send it in by paper, but now they can do it online. Uh, and uh, uh, so then they get a badge which says delegate on it, right? And uh, so we can distinguish the delegates from the observers. And when we vote, it's the delegates that get to vote okay, and debate. Yeah. So anyway, let's see what I think oh, we're almost done. Susan. Oh, and I have an announcement. Susan had, Susan had a question. Oh, uh, Susan, yeah. Um, once the government gets going, is Parliament um, on ongoing uh, full-time job, or would Parliament have different times they meet? And then they go do their thing. No, no, it's a, it's a full-time job. The, the Constitution specifies uh, the responsibilities of a parliamentarian. I think it's a li minimum of nine months that they have to be doing that. Um, so, and the, and the, they'll be paid for that. You know, uh, once the Earth Federation government starts, the parliamentarians will get a salary for being full-time representatives. Yeah. So, I, I did, yeah, it was about the, uh, the, the signatory, like you were reading something about maybe being able to, to sign on, on online or something like that? Yeah, go online, uh, earthconstitution.org, yeah. and uh, you can be a, become a signatory right there. Yeah. Okay. Could I also quickly, I just wanted to suggest that um, given the fact that many people are too poor to travel internationally, and they may have a lot of good ideas for legislation as well, um, is it possible for a person to uh, be a delegate remotely, at least for purposes of proposing legislation, even if they can't travel to the event? Yeah, in fact, the, the legislation is organized and uh, done all online, right? People, okay. people submit it, uh, and uh, uh, the interaction is all online and so on. And we expect if, uh, if a person it may not be possible, as you say, but we expect if a person has proposed legislation that they would come there to defend it, right? This is this is what I want to propose, and you know, and uh, if they don't come there to defend it, uh, right now we don't have uh, uh, the technical ability to Skype people in to the dialogue. That's but you can do that pretty well, easily. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's something I we'll think keep. It would be important because, um, given the fact that you know so many people in the world are, are so poor. Right and just can't right. travel like that. And, right. But they, you know, they, they, they may be the most important people in the world to include in a new world government. The people Absolutely. that currently have no voice because yeah. because they're too many, poor. You know? Yeah, many of our supporters are in Africa, and it, you know, every time I go there to visit, it breaks my heart. Right, they they can't afford the, to travel to the next city, let alone internationally, and uh, uh, and they want to participate. And uh, so one of the other things we, we want to do is 
but you know, if we had the resources, is to have a fund for such people to pay for their trans transportation to get to the bottom. Yeah, I, I think you said yesterday that you're not really getting a response from the UN, the official UN, is that correct? No. But what about NGOs accredited to the UN, uh, people who've been working there for quite a while, are you getting many of them who are interested? We, we haven't uh, uh, been in contact with them. All right. Uh, we, as I say, our, our resources and our personnel yeah. are limited, and that would be something, it would be a good idea to do. Mm -hmm. uh, um, IOWP, the Institute on World Problems, is affiliated with the UN. It's the UN, you know, part of that system. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, and we met when Eugene and I were in Uganda in 2012, uh, we met many people from NGOs connected with the UN uh, because the, the UN opens its arms to global civil society, right? And so there were many people. And it was very interesting that, you know, they say that they concern with global civil society, but it's a world that is organized around sovereign nations. So in Uganda, this big resort right on Lake Victoria, and up the hill, the building with a with a fancy meeting hall where all the representatives of the nations were, you know, uh, official members of the Assembly States parties having to do with the ICC, and then they had a big tent down by the lake, a uh, quarter of a mile away downhill, where and with a big sign, "Welcome Global Civil Society." You come down here in this big tent and discuss your issues, and we'll be up there making the real decisions, you know, and, you know, and that's, that's the way it works. But, but nevertheless, uh, we got contact with many organizations then, but we haven't since, you know, been uh, able to do that. Any other, Eugenia, did you? No, I was just standing because I needed to say. Oh, okay. Any, anyone else? Yeah. I, I really... Uh, I think this has been an excellent presentation. Good. So I think. Uh, so I just wanted to announce then that just today, we Eugene and I have sat down with Eric, and we have a relationship now with Mana, under uh, and it's it's legal uh, because Eugene and I have the authority to make that decision. Uh, uh, under World Legislative Act Number 22, which I mentioned yesterday, is the act that provides a guaranteed annual income to everybody on the planet. Awesome. So, is now the official currency for the beginning yeah. of the year. Can I just say a, a, a word about that? I, I'm, I'm on behalf of. Okay. Um, Gene, you want to go? Yes. I want to give a picture. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I just want to say, um, on behalf of the People's Currency Foundation, which is the nonprofit organization that issues the man of currency into circulation as a universal basic income, that uh, I'm honored that uh, an organization of the stature. Uh, of the World uh, Parliament and Constitution, World Constitution and Parliament Association, uh, would would endorse uh, our currency as the the mechanism uh, by which the people of the world can receive a universal universal basic income. Uh, the fact that your organization has already developed relationships with presidents and prime ministers of countries, and that you have so many scholars and people of, of stature that are supporting your organization, I think is um, a very auspicious reality for the ability of the people of the world to create together uh, a universal basic income. And the fact that um, this is part of the constitution of the Earth Federation uh, has been, you know, from the beginning, and this is a priority of your organization and that you're taking this step to uh, manifest this goal, um, I think is, incredibly important step. Um, and um, you know, as I say, I'm honored to be um, working with you um, to help uh, make that a reality. So. 
Thank you. Thank you. The Oracle Institute and the Peace Pentagon helped network you guys. We're really did. that's yeah. that's, that's yeah, that's what we want to do here at the Peace Pentagon. So All right, let me get a closer. Just I just want to mention one more point. Uh, one of the things that people sometimes say is, uh, and this is true of many many uh, egalitarian people. Even uh, my friend Susan even mentioned it about her uh, vision of government and so on. Many people say we need government that's grassroots, that starts from the bottom up. And, and uh, 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 so there's many people some, that sometimes perceive the Earth Constitution as a top down, but it's not top down, right? That's a misperception because it cannot possibly come into effect without the rat democratic ratification of the people, the bottom up, the, under Article 17. No one is imposing it, and it's impossible to impose it, and we wouldn't want to impose it unless the people want it for themselves. And part of what we're doing uh, is, is uh, showing this and uh, organizing this this is a chart I showed you yesterday of, uh, uh, it's called the linkage between the bottom and the top. So yesterday I showed you the World Parliament with the three houses, the four main agencies, World Police, World Ombudsman, Executive Judiciary, World Administration, and Integrative Complex. The people of Earth will dominate the World Parliament, as we saw yesterday. A thousand. The, the counselors are only 200 people. The House of Nations, maybe 300. The people of Earth, 1,000. So already you have the, the uh, authority of the World Parliament coming from the people of Earth. But one of the things that we're doing, and we saw that in the presentation to a certain extent, we're linking up with NGOs and grassroots development organizations. We've linked uh, with uh, an organization in Bangladesh, which is a pretty substantial organization, called DORP, the Deve Development Organization for the Rural Poor. They're with us. They want to participate in the next session of Parliament and so on. And we've linked, as you saw in the presentation, with Healing Earth, this organization that uh, is planting trees throughout India. And there are several other organizations that are development 